My name is Greg Ingram. I'm president of the Lincoln Institute. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this, the eighth annual land policy conference um, that we have been ho holding uh, for these many years. I want to give Rick the, uh, the podium here. His remarks today are called uh, Is Location Fate? Distributional Aspects of Schooling. He's going to speak for about 45 minutes, we hope. I will help him keep track of the time, and then we'll have about 15 minutes for uh, discussion afterwards. Join me in welcoming Rick. Thank you. Thanks, Greg, for those uh, nice remarks. But I was going to say that uh, Greg talked to me about coming and giving a talk at this conference some time ago. And uh, my motivation was that the Lincoln Institute has papers that are downloaded 100 times a month. And I'm always happy if somebody, if I know that 100 people have read any of my papers as opposed to 100 people, uh, people a month downloading them. So I was hoping to get on that bandwagon um, if I could. <laughs> the second uh, aspect of this is that I um, have been concerned about issues of equity and location and urban things from the very beginning, uh, uh, beginning of my career, I studied some in urban economics early on and thought about location models, and then separately started thinking about education. And over time, I th Greg gave some sense of this, uh, but moved it together. The study of location models has largely been divorced from studies of schools and public finance and things, so that the TWU models are quite separate from the location models, and it gives you a very distorted picture. And one of the things that I wanted to do in preparing for this talk is I started looking at some of the descriptive information about the location of people in schools and of performance, um, and you find that location is really important, that equity really follows location, and I want to sketch out some of those ideas. Um, Greg also asked me to be very broad and, and give the big sweep of things, which in some ways is good for me because then I don't have to admit that most of the people in this room know more about every topic I talk about than I do. Um, but I will give the, an overview and let people fill in details uh, throughout the rest of the time. I should also say that I'm heavily influenced by living in California. I live right next to Mountain View, California, which all of you recognize as the home of Google. And so I'm going to start with essentially the Google Earth view of this whole topic. So imagine yourself starting at about Mars, and we're going to be coming in slowly. We're never going to get to a landing, but we're going to get down closer to Earth as time goes on. But I'm going to start at Mars. Um, so what I want to talk about is I'm going to step back for a minute and talk about the economic value of human capital, which I take it as the schooling aspect of this. I'm going to do that for two specific reasons. One is that it motivates what I think of as important to measure and to look at. And secondly, um, even though it is common to always say human capital is important, I'm going to suggest that people have underestimated the importance of human capital. And I'm going to try to fill in some details to suggest to you that um, not only is it the subject of this conference, but it is the future of the U.S., whether we, in fact, improve our human capital and skills of our population. So I'm going to try to do that quickly. Um, and then I'm going to uh, try to assess gaps by race, which is my shorthand for equity issues. I'm going to concentrate largely on on race because of the locational patterns of race, both traditionally and currently, and the uh, locational patterns of the racial composition of schools. Um, and there the message is going to be that there are really huge costs to allowing persistent gaps 
in the skills by race and that they are really uh, quite astounding. Um, then I'm going to give a little descriptive information on the ge geography of schooling and the geography of equity and race. Um, talk a little bit about w whether we can decompose the gaps that we see into families and schools and peers and so forth, finance. Um, and then get very specific about some selected achievement factors that I think have some evidence of causal impacts on performance. Um, and then it have a completely unsatisfying discussion of policy alternatives. But I'll uh, fill in the details of why it's so unsatisfying as we go on. So there we are. Um, as you can see, it's an ambitious talk. So I'm going to try to go quickly um, and leave a little bit of time to discuss some of the topics. So. It, there are two aspects of the economic returns to human capital. The first one is the one that everybody knows, and that's um, individual earnings. And the, the world of individual earnings and earnings determination is completely Jacob Mincer. Jacob Mincer uh, in the uh, 1960s and then into the 1970s said, well, if there's any substance to human capital thinking um, we've got to have some way to measure human capital. Schools produce skills in people, so the obvious thing to do is to relate the amount of schooling and ex S and experience, experience squared, to incomes. And he showed that you could, in fact, get systematic returns to this. And he was so successful that he convinced the world that school attainment is the best and only measure of human capital. That that's, that's all you had to do is know how many years somebody went to school. So then people started talking about how does um, achievement or quality issues come in and slightly separate discussion. Uh, people say, well, there's a high return, 10% return to a year of schooling. Therefore, there must be a high return if we invest in quality of schooling even though that wasn't in the model. To get around that, then, there have been a number of attempts that simply take the Mincer earnings model and add in what I call cognitive skills at some point here, CS. You just have a measure of achievement, and you add it in to the end of a Mincer earnings equation. If you measure cognitive skills in standard deviation units, then this coefficient that's fee, I guess. Fee is um, a rate of return to a, one standard deviation of achievement. And so people have, have estimated those. In fact, there are a whole bunch of things. The problem with this, I, I'm going to use this model to get some estimates, but the problem with this is that there's this separate body of literature that's going on that's trying to explain um, what I'll call human capital, but achievement of individual kids as a function of families, um, the families, schooling, and the quality of schooling, and abilities, and, and other things. Okay, So if you really believe that that's sort of these educational production functions have something to do with the production of skills, then you wouldn't think that this is the right model to estimate because, in fact, it's schooling and the quality of schooling that's producing the skills and not as something added on to the end. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this, but I uh, have come to believe that Jacob Mincer was much too successful in convincing people how to estimate these things. But let me give you the answers. The answers um, uh, that we have are what's the rate of return? These are these are the coefficients phi in that last equation. What's the rate of return to a standard deviation of cognitive skills um, that uh, there's a whole bunch of recent, seri uh, recent estimates uh, that range in the order of about 15% per standard deviation of achievement. That's the amount of annual earnings throughout the lifetime that somebody can gain. And so remember that, because I'm going to come back to that in a second when we talk about 
how large the gaps are in, by race and, and equity gaps that we have. Um, so there's a second part, though, that I take as more serious, um, which is some recent work that I've been doing uh, recently, largely with Ludger Woosman in Munich, on economic growth and how human capital affects economic growth. Economists have, uh, macroeconomists, uh, starting in uh, about 1990 with um, uh, Bob Lucas, Robert Barrow, Paul Romer, and others, looked at what determines differences in growth rates across nations. It turns out when you look at the data at all, macroeconomists should not be spending all their time talking about business cycles because business cycles are just swamped by differences in growth rates over time. Um, so there was this initial flurry that talked about all the aspects of uh, that determine economic growth differences across uh, countries. Uh, Robert Barrow started the first sort of cross-sectional growth regressions. They're now completely out of vogue in macroeconomics because um, everybody thought, well, human capital across nations has to be important in growth rates. They did the mincer thing of putting in years of schooling and found that, in fact, uh, all the estimates you got were completely sensitive to what else you had in the model, to the other determinants. They uh, sort of weren't always significant. They fell apart and so forth. What I've been arguing, um, so they took a simple model that says growth rates are some function of human capital and other things. Um, and there's some natural other things to include there. But Using the Mincer formulation, just throw in here, let's just substitute years of schooling in. Well, this is obviously nuts, right? This, this can't be right, because it says that a year of schooling in South Africa is the same as a year of schooling in Japan. Um, and it leaves out this same equation I had before, that the determinants of human capital have to do with families and abilities and other factors. Uh, for the World Bank kinds of arguments, it has to do with health of the population and all kinds of other things. It turns out that if you include, instead of taking the measure of schooling, uh, I mean, instead of putting schooling in here for human capital, if you put in international test scores, of which we ha now have lots of comparisons internationally of the math ability of people across nations, you can explain almost all of the variation in growth rates across countries. It takes one simple model, and that is that growth rates are a function of the starting income of the country and the measures of test scores or, or knowledge of the population. You have starting income in there obviously because if you start behind, all you have to do is copy everybody else. But if you start ahead, it's a little bit harder because you have to innovate and invent new things. But once you take that into account, you can explain 75 to 80% of the variation across countries in growth rates with simply knowledge. So that's what I want to look at. Here's a picture of it. Um, this is the picture of the regression. The regression is conditional test scores against conditional growth rates. Conditional only means that you have starting income in it. This is the picture for average annual real growth in GDP per capita for a 40-year period, 1960 to 2000. And what you see is that countries fall pretty close to a straight line. The R squared of that is 0.8. And what you have here is South Africa and Peru and the Philippines. And up here, you get to China and Taiwan and Hong Kong. And somewhere um, in the middle, you get to the US there. But it says, in the long run, the only thing that matters is the skills of the population. Um, and this is the, the strong statement of human capital, but it's the one that I have come to believe. This, these estimates are impervious to whatever else is in the model, uh, to all kinds of manipulations, um, and to uh, also a variety of tests for whether this is, is plausibly a causal relationship or not. Um, and it, it has convinced me. 
So we're going to come back to this in terms of the equity issues in, uh, very quickly. You can do the same with years of schooling, by the way. This is the original uh, estimates. Um, this is conditional years of education versus growth rates. Same sets of, of uh, countries, actually a few more countries. What you see is there's a positive relationship between school attainment and growth rates, but that it's a lot more of a cloud. Uh, but the real story is the following. If you include in it measures of achievement from these international math and science tests, there is no relationship between years of schooling and growth rates. It took me two years to understand what this plot meant. Um, this, this picture says that, in fact, if you go to school and don't learn anything, it doesn't count. And that's... <laughs> um, and so that's, that's the story that we have. Um, there's... Uh, the details of these regressions here um, that I'm going to skip over. You, you explain more, much more of the variation. Years of schooling becomes insignificant in these regressions, and you have a constant impact of a huge magnitude of test scores. So one standard deviation of individual achievement, which is a large number, is 2% per year real growth. 2% per year real growth is an enormous number. Moving on to talking about the school attainment and the distribution of skills. And I'm going to have um, racial undercurrent to all this talk. I'm going to talk about black, white, and Hispanic white differences in, in human capital and the implications of that and relate that to some of the policy things. So if we start out with school attainment um, uh, by, um, by race, here's percent with high school or more starting in 1980 to 2012. Um, I'm hesitant to do this with Dick Murnane in the room because he, he knows all the answers on this, but I think I've got his answers correct. Um, what you see is, you know, there's been a, just a slight uptick in high school attainment for whites because it was high at the beginning in 1980. Uh, but there's been a narrowing of the gap in uh, school attainment for blacks and Hispanics over this time period. Now, part of the argument is if you go up to 2000 when Jim Heckman was doing this, it looked like school attainment was flat for everybody and that this part of this tick is that I've included in GEDs into this story. But if you go on to the um, most recent decade, you find that it appears that there's some real increases in school attainment. But, but there's another part to this story. The other part to this story uh, um, is that if I look at completion of bachelor's degrees by race over time periods, you see a widening, a divergence in uh, completion of college degrees. That is particularly important because all of the evidence over the last two decades suggests that the returns to schooling have disproportionately gone to college education and not to high school education. And so this widening of the gaps of college education is particularly damaging to incomes uh, by race. But what I really want to come back to was what I was talking about before, that I think measures of knowledge and achievement are much more important than years of attainment. Um, in fact, I think there's a relationship uh, that part of this lack of completion of college education is the fact that there are these huge differences in, in achievement, in cognitive skills. So what I have here are uh, plots of the black-white achievement gap over a long period of time. The um, red lines are reading gaps. The blue lines are math gaps, these are on the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or NAEP, 
which has had a consistent measure of achievement across time. And what you, um, these are in the gaps measured in standard deviation units. So what this suggests for black-white gaps, if I look at the math achievement gap of, um, I think it's about 0.85 standard deviations, this suggests that the average black student is at the 19th percentile of the white distribution. This is a huge number. You get about the same picture for Hispanics. It's, it's been spread out a little just the way it's drawn, but a slightly smaller gap for Hispanics at the end, but yet the average Hispanic student is at about the 26th percentile of the white distribution. Now, what does this mean? Well, I'm gonna put this, these numbers into the context of the previous estimates of both individual earnings from these modified augmented Mincer models and then also uh, into the growth models and talk about what these gaps might mean. So if I compare, what would it mean, I, I'm gonna do the following, what would it mean if the average black student or the average Hispanic student rose to the level of achievement of the average white student. If we close the achievement gaps in NAEPs. For individuals, it says blacks would, on average, earn 13% more per year throughout their lifetime. Hispanics slightly less because the gap is slightly less. But this probably underestimates, um, uh, I'm using my interpretation of estimates that Dick Murnane did a while back of the impact of achievement on completion of schooling. So maybe these should be 50% higher per year from the existing gaps. And so it's, we're talking about large amounts there. But when you go to the international growth data, you get something that's entirely different. What I want to do is talk about the GDP losses from maintaining this gap. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to take the picture that I had there of growth rates versus test scores and say, what would happen if over the next two decades we could close the gap by bringing blacks up to whites and Hispanics up to whites over the next two decades? And then I'm going to project out what's the economic cost of that present value terms for the next, for an 80 year period. 80 years is just arbitrary. It's the life expectancy of somebody born today, right? So I project out the increased GDP discount at 3% because some of us aren't as concerned about GDP 80 years from now as others, um, and uh, get the present value of this. Closing the gaps in achievement for blacks and Hispanics with whites would increase average achievement of the US by 0.29 standard deviations. What does it mean if I put that into the regression that we flipped through? It means a present value of $51 trillion on a $16 trillion GDP today. So we're talking about a present value that's three times our total GDP today from closing the black-white and the Hispanic-white achievement gaps. Now, nobody knows what a trillion dollars means, right? I mean, that's, that's a number that's out of sight. Um, uh, actually, uh, my colleague Stan Engerman sent me a quote from Adam Smith the other day that's particularly apropos here. <laughs> Uh, Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, buried in there in, in book four, is, um, is a discussion of the Grand Earl of Warwick, who was supposedly entertained a lot. He supposedly hosted dinners for 30,000 people every night. And Adam Smith remarks, well, that seems implausible, but to get to such an exaggerated amount, it must have been a big number. <laughs> and so that's, 
that's, that's the, the defense here. But putting it into other um, terms, if you compare that to the present value of, of GDP that's going to grow even if we don't improve our schools and don't close these equity gaps, um, it's 7% higher GDP each and every year for the next 80 years. That's the way to think about it. Or alternatively, you can think about it as uh, roughly a 14% increase in everybody, every worker's paycheck for the next 80 years. Okay, so we're talking about very significant amounts here. Um, we have allowed those gaps to pers persist, as I showed you before. Part of the reason for getting into this and part of the work that I did thinking about this talk was to try to look at the geography of student location and where we find students going to schools. So for all students, uh, it turns out 10% of the nation's students go to the top largest 25 districts. And that's been rather constant over time. 30% go to the largest 200 districts. But for blacks and Hispanics, today half of blacks and half of Hispanics are in the largest 200 districts. Um, and it, that's actually dispersed. Uh, let me show you the pictures. This is the total distribution um, this is by district size on the horizontal axis and the percent of the total population. So this is the total where you see that, um, you know, 10% of the population goes to the top 25 districts um, and out to um, roughly 30% in the top 200. But for blacks, and we'll see the same picture for whites, this is 1990. 2000 and 2010. So there's been noticeable dispersion, uh, dispersal of the black and Hispanic population over the last two decades, but it's still very concentrated. So it used to be that um, in 1990, half of the black population were in the largest 100 districts, and that spread out till now in 2000, uh, 2010 half of the black population is in the largest 200 districts. But it's still very concentrated. We're talking about how do we fix the largest districts. You get the same picture for Hispanics, by the way, of both highly concentrated in districts but dispersing over time. But it remains the fact is, can we do anything to fix our largest districts? Uh, um, if we can, we, we would make a significant dent in this total difference in achievement. So then the question is, how much is, of the gap is due to school quality? Um, and this has been a, a matter of intense debate and continual analysis. It started out with the Coleman Report, which is why I got into education in the first place. Um, uh, the Coleman Report came out in the mid-60s and was generally interpreted as saying that the only thing that matters is families. Schools don't make any difference. There was a huge uh, faculty seminar at Harvard when I was a graduate student down the road at MIT in which, as uh, Greg pointed out, John Kane sort of snuck me in the back of this room with that Pat Moynihan um, and Fred Mosteller were running this large seminar to try to understand what that all meant. Since then, there's been this great attempt to sort out, is the low achievement of minorities due to crummy schools in the inner cities, or is it due to their family background or some combination? And there's been a lot of work of this. Part of it has been a presumption, well, there's all these funding disparities. That must be important. And the funding disparities that we see largely come from looking at the rich white, uh, mainly white suburban districts that all of us have lived in with when we, our children are growing up um, and saying, well, these are much more lavish than the average urban district and it must be funding. It turns out that that's not the answer. Um, if I divide up all the districts by the uh, how concentrated the poverty is in those, those districts. Uh, what we find is that the, uh, this is by poverty quintile, starting from the low suburban districts that we talked about to the highest. 
and this is spending per pupil. The highest spending is actually in the most concentrated poverty districts, um, the ones that we see. The next highest is in the suburban districts, and then there's this middle part. Um, now, it might not be enough. We might think that we should actually be spending even more, but the simple fact is that it's not that we're spending less on these schools. Um, you can do a similar thing. Um, uh, this, is, this is my attempt to do the racial distribution of spending um, that comes from weighting district expenditures, assuming that everybody in a district gets the same spending, weighting it by the distribution of blacks, whites, and Hispanics. Um, and what I've got here is 1990, 2000, and 2010. Uh, Black, uh, black students are on the left, Hispanics in the middle, and white students on the right. In 1990, black student spending was slightly above Hispanic, which was slightly above white. What we've seen over time is that Hispanics have fallen behind blacks and whites, but it's still the case that average spending on black students is larger than on white students. Um, for the nation. That having been said, uh, I should add in the comment that I don't think it matters uh, because I've argued somewhat controversial in some places that uh, spending is not very highly correlated with performance, that it's other things that, that count. But I'm putting this up to match perceptions of what the patterns look like. And, you know, most of our public discussions of the perceptions aren't quite accurate. Lots of the debate has gone on about, well, it must be a whole bunch of family influences that uh, it's not the schools so much in uh, these concentrated cities as, as family dysfunction and that that's causing lots of these gap differences. Um, the, the achievement differences, by the way, between central city and suburban districts are about 0.3 standard deviations of NAEP, about half of the racial differences. Um, I think that this whole debate about decomposing the gap is pretty misguided. It, we don't have the ability to do that. We don't have the ability first to measure the quality of schools, which was the original Coleman report problem, as I see it. The Coleman report found that if you looked at achievement as a function of families and measured characteristics of schools, the measured characteristics of schools didn't relate very much to achievement. But that's something different than schools not having an impact because, in fact, schools have a big impact. It's just not very well measured by the things that were surveyed by Coleman and the things that we record in the digest of education statistics. The same holds, by the way, for families, if we're going to talk about the causal impact of families. We know that there's a high correlation between poverty and achievement of kids, um, but how much of that is caused by low incomes as opposed to a bunch of other things or locational choices or what have you. So anyways, uh, my summary here is that we should not spend a lot of time talking about the decomposition of achievement gaps. But what we ought to do is concentrate more on things that we think plausibly are causally related to achievement and whether we can change those. So I'm going to list the three things at the top of my list of potentially causal factors that we have some evidence for as having a causal relationship and then talk quickly about the policy. I've timed this so that the policy discussion is going to be very quick because that's the rest of the discussion for the conference here. Uh, but let me go through this. So the things that I would put up is that um, I've convinced myself, um, I convinced myself largely by my own work is the most convincing that I have. But, um, but, there's a, but it, I'm going to assert that it's broader than that. Um, that racial concentration, particularly for blacks, is an important feature. 
Um, there's some evidence to the stuff that I've done in Texas with John Keane and Steve Rifkin. There's stuff by uh, Josh Angrist and Kevin Lang on METCO programs and some other things. Um, Race and achievement have been a long story starting in 1954 with Brown versus the Board of Education. There was essentially no evidence of harm from, at least to achievement, from its segregation in 1954. Most of the subsequent stories were only about the effects, immediate effects of desegregation decisions if you force people to move and so forth. More recently, though, I think that there's evidence that um, racial concentration is important. Um, the estimates that we would have from Texas suggest that if you equalize the racial con concentration of schools across the state of Texas, which is hard to do, you would close 10% of the seventh grade gap in achievement. Um, if you equalize them for the periods fifth through seventh grade, it's a big effect. Um, it has no effect on Hispanics, by the way, as far as I know, and I know of no evidence that concentrations of Hispanics have the same impact. Secondly, I would point to teacher quality. Um, there have now been lots of studies, starting with the uh, work in Texas that John Kane and I did and Steve Rifkin, um, and others, um, Dick Murnane, I've done things in the past, a number of people have done things in the past, that suggest that variations in teacher quality are really important. Um, there's a whole series of recent studies that I would give you of this that uh, indicate uh, this is individual, these are individual studies um, across the US basically of reading uh, this is the standard deviation of uh, student, one standard deviation of teacher quality yields 0.13 standard deviations in growth of students. It turns out that that's a big number. Um, and you get something, schools have a larger impact on math performance. This has a huge impact uh, if we talk about teacher quality, and this is why I would say that schools have an enormous impact, but it's all in terms of variations in teacher quality, or most of it. Um, there's been uh, some open questions about what is the distribution of teacher quality by race by school districts. It's always presumed that central city schools have crummy teachers, in part because the average achievement level is low. As I look at the evidence, it suggests that there's much more variation within any school than there is between school districts and between schools. And that most of the variation in teacher quality resides in your own lavishly spent, uh, funded schools that your kids went to. When we look at teacher mobility, there's, there's some studies that I've done and some that Dan Goldhaber have done that suggest that the best teachers aren't the ones that are moving away from the schools with high poverty concentrations. It's more of a random selection of, of schools. So we don't know a lot about the distribution of teacher quality, but we know it's important. And then finally, the, the, the topic that um, uh, Jim Heckman has, has made a worldwide subject of discussion is early childhood education. Uh, it starts with some uh, studies in the mid-90s by Hart and Risley that suggest that at, at entry to school, middle class kids know four times the number of words that a uh, low, lower class child knows. And it suggests that preparation in the family before getting to school is extraordinarily important. And then it's backed up by a couple of very small scale, what I'd call demonstration programs, Perry Preschool and Abbas Sedarian. Uh, Perry Preschool in, in um, Ypsilanti, Michigan was in a very intensive two year training program, teachers with master's degrees, six to one student teacher ratios, $15,000 per student in 2000, in, in the year 2000. So it's not what you call your everyday uh, preschool program. Abbasidarian starts at conception and follow, takes care of kids from conception on to 
uh, entry into school at $75,000 per kid in 2000. So we have evidence that these are important, but the evidence comes from programs that are not the ones that you're likely to see put into place. So this is my evidence, uh, this is my selected list of things that I think have evidence of causal impacts with some questions, open questions. Um, and let me talk a little bit about policy then. Dealing with racial concentration, um, they, I suggested that this is really important for particularly black youth. Um, the studies that we did are even more pointed in saying that it's the high ability black students that are hurt most by high concentrations of black students in their schools. Uh, this comes back to the story I gave you before about the low college attendance uh, or completion rates of blacks versus whites and that widening gap. I don't think there are many options. Um, it's an important issue, but the largest cities, uh, most of the variation in racial concentration is between school, between districts and not within districts. And we've done a lot to equalize the concentrations within districts, but they're very high concentrations. We have uh, Supreme Court decisions that suggest that even desegregation policies within districts are taboo if they're race-based. And then between districts, we don't have much available. We, there might be some land use policies that Greg will bring up, but uh, uh, in general, that I don't think is much to do. I actually think that there's, there are things to do in direct performance incentives, particularly for teachers. Um, these are plausible, but they're politically difficult, obviously. Uh, all of you remember that there was a strike in Chicago last September that put 300,000 kids on the streets for 10 days. That was largely about the evaluation of teachers and whether evaluations of teachers would be used in any personnel decisions. So there are certain political economy kinds of issues. On the other hand, there's some reason for optimism. I'm actually very optimistic because a dozen states or so have now made fairly dramatic moves to change teacher labor laws to make it more plausible to uh, adjust salaries and work tenure uh, based upon quality. We have Washington, D.C., which is a great example, in my opinion, of how teacher evaluations and personnel policies can work together. They now, for the last three years, have had a contract that calls for evaluation of teachers using value-added scores of achievement if you have them, but for, for the vast majority of teachers, they, those aren't available. But what there is is a core of evaluators who come into classrooms multiple times during the year, rate the teachers. If you're in the top quintile of the distribution for two years in a row, you can get bonuses in your, or you can get your base salary moved up by up to $25,000 on an average of sixty-five dollars or $70,000. So it's moving base salaries by a huge amount. If you're in the bottom quintile for two years in a row, you're fired. In the last three years, about 1,000 teachers have gotten bonuses, not all that large of 25,000, and about 400 teachers have been fired. If I go to Los Angeles, within the current contract, John Dacey has, uh, over the last year, fired 100 teachers. Now, 100 teachers is kind of trivial in a school system of 700,000 students, but it's 30 times what had been done every year in the past, prior to that. So there's, there's some hope that performance incentives of some court can be used. Expanded preschool, um, I think it's very important, particularly for equity concerns. The idea behind preschool is simply that we provide some supports and replace uh, limited family 
education before kids get into school. Um, there are a bunch of open policy questions. We're not going to put in place an abecedarian program, I don't think, of $75,000 per kid, uh, particularly in current budget things. Uh, the president has argued for universal preschool of some time. We now have about 75% uh, of uh, third and fourth, uh, age three and age four students in preschool. And we have a, a program, a federal program, Head Start, that has 900,000 kids already in preschool. Uh, the only problem is it's a crummy program. It's been evaluated every year since Lyndon Johnson's time, or every five years, there's a cycle. Every five years it says that the program isn't doing anything educationally, and yet it continues on. So that's a, by the way, at a, on a full-time basis, Head Start is about a $20,000 a year program compared to $10,000 annual expenditures for uh, K to 12 education. So it's an expensive program, it doesn't work, and there's some reason to think that we could improve that, except for the fact that the Head Start lobby is extraordinarily strong. Um, it looks something like teachers' unions' lobbies, uh, but, but for another purposes. Expanded choice, uh, Greg mentioned uh, before, I think is one of the important elements of trying to provide more equity. The argument about the location uh, race schooling connection uh, that locks poor and minority families into uh, given schools that doesn't lock us in, but it locks them in. Uh, the idea of choice is to expand that. And it turns out that uh, some of the work that Tom Nekaba has done, some of the work that I've done with others, suggests that more choice is really important in opening up uh, the markets. We do have some uncertainty about the impacts because the studies of charter schools that have come out recently uh, give very mixed results. Um, my wife, who has been studying charter schools for a while, will report on national results in another couple of weeks. But the, the overall answer is that there are some really very good charter schools there are some really very bad charter schools, and there's a lot in the middle that are about the, the same as the public schools. It turns out, as, as I read the evidence, the regulatory and authorization package that varies across states and cities is really important. Um, the ability to have charter schools that are so regulated or constrained contributes, in fact, to, the fa uh, to some states having very poor charter schools. And it contributes, on the other hand, to some states having extraordinarily good, on average, charter schools. So that's something that we don't know a lot about, but is an important element. Um, and then there's the, um, always talk about school finance changes. Um, some of you know that I have reasonably strong views on this. Um, I see that most of the school finance changes that we've tried have had very little impact on student achievement. It's absorbed a lot of attention and a lot of, of political activity and with very little impact. And this is partly the answer that Funding itself is not the answer. It's the incentives and the structure of the schools that are important, that if we got the incentives better, we might, in fact, get better schooling. So I'll, I'll stop there with, with this unsatisfactory list uh, that I know will be filled in largely, in, in many cases, by the parts of the conference yet to come. Thank you.